Hey guys, this week prices for oil dropped to $40 the barrel. Those are the lowest levels ever recorded. Essentially producers are paying money to get rid of their oil. How could this happen? Does this mean that oil doesn't have value anymore? Can you get rich by storing oil in your backyard? And what will happen to prices in the future? Stick around and you'll find out more. Hey everyone, my name is Philip Dawes and I'm a partner with Simon Kutcher and Partners, a strategy consultancy focused on pricing and revenue growth. This week, prices for WTI crude oil fell to negative $40 the barrel. Those are the lowest levels ever recorded. Today, I'll try to explain why this happened and also give some insights of what might happen to oil prices coming up in the future. There are two fundamental drivers that were responsible for lowering prices um, of oil. Number one is a demand shock, and this one probably doesn't come as a big surprise. We all know about COVID and how it's impacting our everyday lives. But it's not just, as you know, a US phenomenon. What's unique about COVID is that the pandemic is affecting all economies around the world. And when it comes to oil, um, the United States, Europe and China are the largest consumers in the world. And essentially these three economies are being shut down at the same time. Now, of course, this has a huge impact on oil consumption. Nobody's driving cars, no airplanes are flying, nobody's consuming products that are made out of oil. Um, so of course demand goes back, but again, impact is dramatic. And we've seen reductions in the demand of oil of 25 to 30%. Just to put this into perspective, in 2009, which was the last time we saw any type of reduction in oil demand, um, reduction went back to two to three percentage points. So again, this is a massive impact, unprecedented in terms of size, and also it comes very, very quickly. Just to give you some um, idea for the dimensions that we're talking about here, just think about an oil tanker. So oil tankers are the largest man-made vessels. They capture around about 2 million barrels of oil. And they're larger than an aircraft carrier, but also if you put an uh, oil tanker next to the Eiffel Tower or next to the Empire State Building, they're even longer than, the, than these buildings are. So they're massive structures. And you need about 7,200 tank trailers in order to fill one of those ships up. And when it comes to the consumption previous to the crisis, you had around 100 million barrels of oil consumed per day. That's the amount that fits into 50 super tankers. Now again, with that demand shock, um, now we are up to about 12 to 15 tankers that don't have a home. This happens every single day. Apart from the demand shock, there was also a supply shock. On March 10th um, of uh, last month, uh, the OPEC plus countries met, uh, supposedly to discuss uh, limitations to their productions. However, they couldn't come to an agreement and at the end of the meeting, they actually uh, communicated an increase of production. So Saudi Arabia, the number two producer in the world, said it would hike up productions by about 300,000 barrels per day. And Russia responded that they were also looking into increasing production between 200 and 300,000 barrels per day. So you have a demand shock and on the supply side actually produces an increasing volume. Um, so that means from a macroeconomic perspective, the demand curve shifts to the left, the supply curve shifts to the right, and of course there is a price drop. And that's also, of course, what we were observing in the market. Now, many oil and gas executives were blaming Saudi Arabia and Russia for the current crisis. When we talked to roughly 200 experts of the industry, 58% of them said, well, the price war is the main cause for deteriorating price levels. However, of course, the truth is a bit more complex. So if we look, for example, at the uh, production levels of the top three producers, um, you can see there was an enormous increase um, of the production from the United States over the last decade. And that's what's called the shale revolution, or you all have heard about fracking. There were new technologies that essentially enabled US producers to pump a massive amount of oil out of the ground. 
Now, the US turned in this last decade from a net import of oil to a net export of oil, becoming the number one producer. And if you just look at the development, um, US never restrained themselves simply because the government in the US is the only government in the world that's not limiting outputs. All of this explains why prices of oil would go down. It does not necessarily explain why they go to negative $40 a barrel. And also keep in mind that just one week before we had this price uh, deterioration, um, Trump announced that OPEC Plus actually had come to an agreement. So the OPEC Plus countries said, yes, we will cut production. So why do prices go down? Well, first of all, those agreed upon production cuts are not very significant compared to the demand slump. Um, production is supposed to be reduced by about 10%, so roughly 10 million uh, uh, barrels per day. And as I said before, demand has decreased by about 25 to 30%, so this is not nearly enough. Secondly, those reductions won't take effect until May 1st. So that means today and tomorrow and the day after, until May, Every single day, we have this massive overproduction going into the market and also taking up storage capacities because nobody is using that stuff. Thirdly, there's a more technical reason uh, why prices went to negative amounts. As you know, stocks cannot go below zero. However, oil is traded in futures. Futures essentially are an agreement to buy or sell an asset, typically a commodity, um, at a predetermined price at a specific time in the future. So if you will, it's a bet on price levels to happen in the future. Just to give you a, a simple example, um, a farmer uh, that wants to raise crops typically needs a lot of cash to do so. They need to have money to buy seeds, they need to buy fertilizers, there's machinery involved, storage capacities and so on. It's a very capital uh, intensive uh, profession. So typically farmers go to the bank and in order to get money from the bank, they have to say at which price levels they want to sell those crops. And of course, harvests vary every year, so price levels vary as well. And in order to transfer that risk to the bank, there's this construct of futures. And you have the same construct in, in oil. Uh, futures in oil and gas are typically traded on a monthly level. So when we talk about the price of oil going down by $40 uh, or negative $40, what we're really talking about is are the futures for WTI, West Texas Intermediate, for May. And the interesting thing is that those contracts expired last Tuesday. So all the price uh, slump that we saw Monday were only related to those futures expiring on Tuesday for the May tranche. And of course, they went down because in May, everything is shut down. We're still in lockdown and the oil has no place to go. Now, what's interesting is that typically spot prices of an asset are higher than the prices of its underlying future. Now, in some cases, like in this case of oil, it's the other way around, and that situation is called a contango. A contango is a situation where a trader is essentially betting on a future market where prices go up. Now, they buy oil, and of course, that oil has to go somewhere until they can sell it at a higher price point. It has to go to storage. Now, what happened on Monday is that, number one, the market realized that we're not going to come back economically that fast. Uh, we're still in lockdown. COVID-19 is there. Nobody's going to fly airplanes. Nobody's going to drive their cars around. So nobody's going to use the oil. But also that the world is running out of storage capacity. So let's talk about storage. Um, up front, it's very difficult to estimate global storage capacities. There are different numbers floating around, which also led to the uncertainty of the markets on Monday. A company called Kepler estimates global capacities at 6.8 billion barrels, and they say that 70% of that capacity, as per last week, has already been used up. That makes ultimately 1.8 billion barrels of capacity that's still available. Uh, there's a bank, UBS, that essentially said that numbers have that size. Um, what we know is that capacity in the U.S. is running out. Currently, we have stored oil for about 40 days of uh, national production. So it's, it's unprecedented. 
Storage capacity is also the reason why Brent and WTI are currently traded at very different price levels. Uh, Brent essentially refers to oil that's produced offshore. Um, it's named after an oil field in the North Sea. And the assumption is that essentially oil can get dumped directly into tankers or super tankers and being shipped around to meet global demand. On the other side, West Texas Intermediate is per definition oil that has been produced by, uh, by uh, rigs or by, by wells that are landlocked. So they're at least 500 miles from the next shore. And in the US, we have a massive system of pipelines in order to transport this oil. Um, around 240,000 miles of pipelines um, are installed currently to produce, uh, sorry, to transport crude oil. And you can imagine that if we have a demand shock, there's still so much oil in the system. It's kind of like a freight train that's very difficult to stop. And again, the assumption is that um, the wells still need to produce. Uh, so the producers are essentially willing to pay money to get rid of that oil, which is what happened on Tuesday. Why can't producers just reduce production? Well, it's not as easy as turning down the tap at your house. Um, first of all, you can damage the well. You might not be able to bring production levels up to the former levels. There's a lot of manpower involved in, in shutting down production. So it might just make more sense to continue producing and keep on losing money with low oil prices or negative oil prices than shutting down the well. Also, um, at low price levels, there's still cash coming in. And a lot of, particularly the smaller producers and the mid-sized companies, they're very uh, much debt ridden and they need to produce cash in order to stay afloat. That being said, there already have been massive shutdowns and there will continue to be massive shutdowns, both in Texas as well as in the uni entire United States. On average, producers said that they would cut CapEx by 35%, likely with the last developments, those numbers will go up even higher. So as you can see, you cannot really get rich by storing oil in your backyard, unless you have a fantastically big backyard, can store hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil, plus you have a direct access to one of our pipelines. Now, but what will happen to the price of oil? Will it go up further? Will we see again what we saw on Monday in the coming months, what is going to happen to the price of oil in the future? Well, I'm not a fortune teller and I cannot predict the price of oil. And if I did, I probably would do something else. Maybe I wouldn't. But there are certain indicators that we can look at to get a good glimpse at what is lying ahead of us. So let's first look at demand levels. Um, and if you look at uh, what's happening with Corona right now, my personal guesstimate would be that it's at least another two to three weeks, maybe four, until states uh, start to uh, open up their, their lockdowns. Well, there's some exceptions. You might have heard of Las Vegas, you might have heard of Georgia, but all the sentiment in the public currently is that uh, it's too early. So even if you opened up these economies, um, consumers still would be scared. And that means they're not willing to spend on travel. They're not willing to spend on transportation. So even if you opened up the economy, very likely the demand is not going to uh, go back to the levels that are necessary to support the current amounts of oil. Second, let's talk about production cuts. Currently, as I mentioned, companies are going through severe cuts. However, it's not very likely that those cuts will be sufficient for the U.S. shale producers. Um, in a study that we did together with Rice University, um, we found that on average the production cost, or rather the break-even cost, for shale producers currently is at about $42 per barrel. Of course, it depends on the well, etc. But if we work with the $42 average, you can see even if prices went back to levels of 30, 35 dollars a barrel where they were um, at the beginning of the year, it's not going to be sufficient uh, in order to keep the small and medium sized producers afloat. And there are lots of companies out there that are heavily debt ridden. Um, and even some larger companies like Halliburton, Apache or um, Marathon Oil um, are very likely to get into real trouble. 
So we will see a consolidation of the market. We will see lots of M&A activities going on and frankly, a lot of bankruptcies. Now the hope is that that consolidation will also lead to more discipline of the larger players. My personal opinion is that we won't see that discipline um, simply because the larger players also need to earn their cash. Um, so um, my personal estimate is uh, that, that this will not necessarily impact the, uh, the production volumes in the midterm. Then there's government regulation. The government could step in to set production limits. And actually this very week, um, we had the Texas Railroad Commission, so the organ that regulates the production of oil, come together and discuss should we cap production, yes or no. And they came to the conclusion that we shouldn't. Um, so my personal uh, opinion again is I don't think this will happen in the, in the near term. And even if it did, we currently have so much volume in storage that it's not going to help those small and mid-sized producers. Storage capacity. As I said before, we're currently filling our storage capacities to the rim, not just in the US, but also abroad. And there are indications for that, such as that the rates for super tankers are going up by over 700% in Asia. And that's an indication that those tankers are also being used not just to transport oil, but as a storage facility in and of itself. So in my personal opinion, I think we're pretty far away from a silver lining. And I personally also think that what happened last Monday can very much happen next month again. Some analysts are even talking about price levels of negative $100 per barrel. Now, the silver lining is that in the mid to long term, so two to three years, executives in the industry all agree that consumption levels will go back to normal. And of course, prices will also go back to, no to normal levels, which are around 50 to $60 per barrel. I hope you found this helpful. Um, if you share my opinion, please comment below. If you disagree, please also share your opinion below. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you.